All right, if you are ready to take a ride with me and learn more about how to become a joyful badass, then you are in the right place and I'm gonna jump right in. No more introductions are necessary. So you might be asking yourself, what in the world is a joyful badass? What exactly is she talking about? This is one of my favorite pictures because I think it clearly shows the whole, what, WTF, I don't know. So in my world, the joyful badass world, um, a joyful badass is a person, anyone, but I specifically work with women. So we'll just say women in this case, but a, a woman who knows what brings her joy, and we'll talk about that as we go through. She's self-aware. She's familiar with her values, her visions, her dreams. She knows herself, right? And because she knows herself, then able to use that knowledge to create boundaries, to be bold, to take risks, and to live her life in the way she sees most fit. So before we get too deep into this, we need to know the differences between joy and happiness, okay? So joy comes from your internal mechanism. It's who you are, it's what lights you up. It's independent of circumstances, it's inner contentment, it's the eternal. So it's long lasting. It, it's based on who you are and what makes you really who you are. So <clears throat> when we talk about happiness, that's dependent on circumstances, emotional response. It's inconsistent, it's temporary. Think about, especially in the time period that we've been in in these last few weeks, I mean, we've been on an emotional roller coaster, um, or a lot of us have, and as a result, our, our emotional state is, is moving at a rapid pace, right? So we might be happy one minute, we might be sad, we might be upset, we might be worried, we might be happy. So all of that impacts us, right? So we're gonna talk today more about joy because that is something that we actually have control over. Because happiness comes from outside sources, we can't always control it, we just respond to it. But with joy, that is truly from within and no one can take it from you unless you decide to give it to them. So I work with organizations and business leaders to find more joy for their people in the work are entitled to joy in work. We work approximately 90,000 hours of our lives and that's a really, really long time to be miserable. It's a really long time not to be doing work that lights you up. It's a long time to be miserable and not doing work that grows you as a person, that helps you be an even better version of yourself and really allow to develop and pursue passions and talents that will make not only you better, but also make your contribution to your workplace even better. So in order to be a joyful badass, we have to start with embracing a growth mindset. So when we embrace a growth mindset, we're starting the foundation of a growth mindset is self-awareness. And ultimately a growth mindset also means that we believe our intelligence can be developed, that our brain at whatever age you are is not, it's not finished, it continues to grow. And that is true, that's our neuroscience background, right? And when we embrace a growth mindset, then we're open to challenges. We're persistent when those challenges come up. We don't let them stop us. We just keep moving, we look for another way right and when we are in a growth mindset we appreciate the effort so the journey we're learning from the journey we are learning from feedback and criticism we are finding inspiration for others and then on the opposite side when we're living in that fixed mindset then you know we don't want to challenge we give up Things get hard, we, we see effort is pointless, we have lots of excuses, um, maybe we, we have an idea and we talk ourselves out of it or we speak an idea out 
loud and people say, oh, that doesn't sound very, that sounds dumb. I mean, why that? And instead of being persistent and embracing the challenge and learn criticism, we may say, wow, I think you're right. Okay, I'm not gonna try that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, okay. Fixed mindset also is ignoring negative feedback, but yet it's embracing negative feedback from your own brain. So, and when we're in a fixed mindset, we're feeling threatened by their success. And, you know, we've all been, I have, I can speak for myself. I've been jealous. I've listened to negative feedback and allowed it to sway my, and to not do when in reality, if I had just taken those thoughts and looked at them from a growth mindset, then I would have been less likely to, you know, fall prey to that. You know, as women, we often find ourselves in a place of imposter syndrome, or we feel like we can't do things, or we downplay our strengths and our skills. And part of that, when we do that, it leaves us in that fixed mindset place. So I encourage you to embrace a growth mindset. Start there. Think about how you can continue to grow your brain, continue to be intelligent, continue to maximize those neural connections. The more we learn, the more our brain grows. It's like when we do make our brains grow, then we are making that muscle even stronger, right? Because if you were trying to, you know, toned up or go run, for example, I've run a half marathon, you can't just get off the couch and go run a half marathon. Well, I couldn't. So there was a lot to be done. I had to be persistent. It was a challenge. I had to give a lot of effort. I got feedback from people who were experts and I listened to podcasts and learned all kinds of things to make myself a better runner, to be more successful, to not get injured. There's, a, there's a, so much benefit when you begin to embrace the idea of a growth mindset. And then what we want to do after we've embr we embraced this growth mindset and from that, we really want to develop a deeper sense of self-awareness, okay? So self-awareness is a foundational aspect of everything that we're talking about. So growth mindset is the, is the belief that we can continue to learn, obviously, and grow. And that all starts with self-awareness. So today I wanna to encourage you in your journey to be a joyful badass, to think about and envision your future. What are your dreams? What do you want? What are you thinking? What are, what are your big bucket lists, right? So if you happen to have a piece of paper, then I would encourage you to think about what are some of your dreams? What do you want to accomplish? I find that starting with dreams, um, we don't do a lot of that as adults, do we? Yeah, we have the idea of a bucket list, maybe things we want to do and see before we die, but dream, a, you know, maybe closer to my future and not have all these things out there, like, okay, death is the catalyst. I want to dream and have a life that fulfills me, that creates joy, that validates my joy, and that out of my comfort zone. I think hopefully sometimes your dreams are bigger than you, right? They're bigger than you are. They're bigger than the people around you and they need to be validated and shared and put out there. I firmly, firmly believe that when you dream and you write it down and you make lists and you speak into the universe, then you have the ability to manifest and create the future. So one of the things I love to encourage people to do is yes, make a list of all your dreams. Just brainstorm it out. Set a goal of listing maybe dreams. And believe me, if you push yourself and you put a limit or maximum, minimum, whatever, you'll just keep pushing. You'll just keep pushing. So think about your dreams. Make a list. The thing I encourage you to do, I had the, oh my gosh, this was like last week, 
we are in, you know, our quarantine. It's just my husband and me. My son is in his apartment. And so we set up a hammock in our backyard. And we're all lying on our backs, looking at the clouds. And, and we're doing that thing we used to do when we were kids. Oh, that looks like an upside down monkey. Um, maybe he's climbing a Christmas tree. Now it's turning into a giraffe that looks like a shark. You know, just that ability to let your brain just and be creative and explore. And I find that when I lie still and I'm looking at the sky or I'm just kind of in a quiet place like we were that day, it opens you up to think about those dreams because we are programmed that when you're children, when you're a kid, you dream, you've got this great big plan for your future. But then once you get to be an adult, that's when you're implementing the dream, you're taking action for the dream. But really what happens is we have new experiences we meet new people, we have new dreams. And so it is not the time to stop dreaming. List those out, create the day in your mind. What would that look like? Another action that you can take within this is to write yourself a letter describing your absolute perfect day, right? From the minute you get up to the minute you go to bed right? What does that day look like? And that day may or may not include working where you're currently working. It may not include doing what you're doing. It may or may not include the people that you're current with. What is the dream, the vision for your future? So for me, I have done this action, written a letter to myself. I try to revisit it every, well, Quarterly, if some of the dreams have goals designed, if I have a dream that I really want to materialize, then that dream may need some action. It's just not left out there floating into space as a thought. Perhaps I need to take some action. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we continue through the, the webinar here. But Creating those dreams and then creating action around them, that's kind of what the write a letter to yourself looks like. You're not really setting goals, you're describing what you want. And then from that, you can develop goals. Now, the next thing that is very valuable in this process is get connected to your personal values. What do you value? This is slightly different from your belief system, right? It's really what do you value? And do you use those values to drive your decisions, both personally and professionally? So a really great book and resource is a book called The Values Factor by John Demartini. And if you have not uh, read that book, I'm, I'm new to it just last year, but it really walks you through a process of evaluating your values and determining what is important to you and how you want to make decisions for your life. So for example, one of the things that you could, in order to explore your values, obviously you could read the book, right? Or, and or, you can yet again, get another sheet of paper. So you got a list of dreams, you got a letter that is describing your perfect day in the life of your future. And now we wanna know what values do we, do we have so that helps us drive those things into a reality, right? And that is part of finding our joy, is knowing what we value. Because if you are working out of alignment with your values, that is why you are not joyful, possibly miserable, living in fear, hesitant to take a risk, not sure of your next steps. It's almost like you get yourself into a, a stuck place, a frozen pattern, back into that you know fixed mindset, it freezes you. So in order to discover your values, you can, as I said, get a sheet of paper, you can fold it into a three, like a, a trifold, 
if you will. And in one column, call it time. The next column, call it uh, money. And then you might also make a column for additional resources. But time and money are your most valued resources, I suppose. Like you've got time, you've got money. How are you investing those two resources in your world? So you think about where do I always spend time? If, if you have to make a choice between everything on your plate, what gets your time? I've done this with numerous people in numerous workshops and so frequently what comes up is my family. You know, if you're a mom, oftentimes it's your kids. Um, it might be your, your, you know, your intimate relationship. Um, you know, so you always make time for that. I always make time for reading. I am a avid reader because I discovered one of my values is knowledge. I need knowledge. It's also a strength, that accumulation of knowledge. So when I made my list and I did this exercise thinking about where do I always spend my time? You know, I started thinking, oh, I, I spend a lot of time uh, on travel. I spend a lot of time on learning. I spend a lot of time on my relationships, my family, uh, you know, my immediate family, my extended family people that I meet, people that I know, people that I want to know. So look at where you're spending time. And then in the second category, you're, you're writing down where you spend money. And that is a huge indicator for me. If you can find an area or if you see an area where you're always making sure you have the money for that, right? Then that is something important. And Another interesting thing, since I've done this workshop, men and women, but it's very, it's always funny. I did this workshop with some teachers um, in a staff development training, two days of staff development. You would not believe the number of wine that came across. <laughs> I always have time for wine and I always have money for wine. Target was a close second. So, but that's, that, that's how a way for you to see what do you value. Now, obviously, if you read um, Dr. Dave Martini's book, it goes much deeper and it extends out into things like if you look around your personal space, what do you have pictures of? So for instance, right now I'm in my office. I have a lot of pictures. Well, I have a huge map of the world. Um, I have pictures of my son, pictures of my son, pictures of my son. Um, so obviously my son is important. So is traveling because most of my photos that are not of my son are of landscapes or, you know, various outdoor activities or places because I adore travel and it, it brings me knowledge. I can make new relationships. And what I discovered also in my own journey is that I need freedom. And an interesting take on this whole idea is that Oftentimes what you value comes from where there was a void, all right? And this could be from the past and the void may change. So for me, I grew up in a small town. My dad was, the, was a pastor. And so there was a lot of expectation on behavior um, due to his job. There was limitations on traveling and doing things. He worked every weekend. He was there on, you know, had to be there on Sunday. And it's not that it was bad or it was terrible or there was anything about it, but because I did not have as much control how I could spend my time, now having that control is super important. And of course, I spent years in a traditional education. Like I was a teacher, a classroom teacher, most of my life and then moved into the school. The schedule of a school does not contribute to freedom right? It's very structured. You're very locked into it. You can barely use the bathroom and eat lunch. So when I left the classroom, wow, man, freedom, whew, so important because in some ways it was a lack. So when you make your three columns or your two columns, look at the two lists, what shows up repeatedly. And if you choose the book, there's a lot more questions. And so over and over again, what is popping up? And that's how I came up with my values, freedom, knowledge, and relationships.
Now, the next thing to be a joyful badass is to really take a look at where you are investing your energy. Now, we did talk about that slightly in the last um, slide. And so what we're going to do here is talk about our life. And then in addition to that, we've got another survey. So this survey is kind of like looking at this life wheel and thinking about what area of your life feels most joyful right now. So I'm going to talk a bit about the life wheel. And if you would, please be so kind as to take a moment to take our survey. And then I will be sharing those results with you. So energy, life wheel, right? We've got these different categories in our life. We have recreations and hobbies. We have health and fitness, career, business, our spirituality, the family and friends that we spend time with, our, our romantic relationships, personal development, and then of course our finances and net worth. So when we look at this, one of the things I like about this wheel is it allows you to kind of give yourself a score, right? Right now, um, our recreation and hobbies, if we're getting creative, maybe it's an eight. If we don't have a lot of options, maybe it's a two, because here we are. Finances, we could be in a similar place with our finances because you know things are very unusual right now. Many people are unemployed, their businesses are closed down, they're very worried about you know their next paycheck, they're worried about how they're gonna buy groceries. And so there may not be joy in that space right now. And that hopefully is very temporary. Same for personal development, same for your romantic relationships. I don't know. It's interesting to me that you've got so many people who are, you know, stuck in their spaces together. How is this impacting your relationships with your spouse and your significant other and or your family constantly with you? I often think that it is good that my son is at his apartment because as much as I love him, it's challenging adults are in your house now. He's not a boy anymore. I can give him my advice, but I can't tell him what to do. So all of our life areas may be in different places right now, especially because of what we're going through. So you're welcome to look at this COVID-19 quarantine. You're welcome to look at now, obviously, it's where you are. And then I like to do this um, I have a journal that I use called the Phoenix, wait, I think it's the, no, it's not the Phoenix planner. It's, um, it's called the legend planner and that planner the life wheel in it for every month. And you can evaluate where your joy is and your energy and how satisfied are you in these places that are, you know, typical topics lives. You can take this life wheel and change it to put in aspects of your work. So obviously if you're at work, all of these aspects would be mildly different. So it could, you still have relationships, um, but there may be some other aspects of it that you could tweak so that you can take a deeper look at your work life too. Cause this is basically your personal life, getting a look at where do you feel, you know, the joy, where do you feel um, most joyful? All right, so I'm not sure where we are on our survey, but I'm gonna leave it just for a few more moments. Oh, wait, oh, we have the results. So the areas of our life where our participants feel most joyful right now is with their friends and with their family. I'm guessing that may be related to the fact that we are all together. And for so many people that I've, I've you know, seen on Facebook and so on, they are loving being, loving the opportunity to reconnect with their people on this level. Um, the next highest one is recreation and hobbies. So hopefully people are maybe learning some new things, trying some new things. I got an adult coloring book this week. So I'm excited about that new hobby. Romance and relationships are our next top with 15%, personal development 15%. So Friends and family was top at 24. This is really interesting. And so I think it would be cool to do this for yourself in the future, like when we're done with this and see if anything changed or if anything 
<clears throat> or, and so that's a way for you to take a look at a place where you might need to find more joy. So how does all this information lead to the joy factor? So as we discussed, we have to be a joyful badass, we need to, or we, sh we can consider our growth mindset. Are we actively seeking to grow our brains? All right. Are, and the second part is, are we developing self-awareness? Are we trying to understand ourselves, right? Are we thinking about our dreams? Are we visioning our future? Are we, you know, checking in with our values and making sure that what we're doing is in alignment? Are we looking at our life categories and saying, yeah, there's a discrepancy, there's a variance. Maybe the reason I don't have a lot of joy in this area is because what I'm doing is not aligned with my values. Because for example, if I went back to work in a school, in a classroom, as I was years ago, my joy factor in my work would be significantly lower than it is now because the lack of freedom, it, that would be a straight up lack of freedom. In fact, that's the reason why I left a job that I had with the district, with the district because there just wasn't enough freedom. We want to reveal your joy. The joy is really um, like the juice. It's the, it's the gas to your joyful badass, right? It's, it's that underlying foundation that gives us confidence and power. So one of the ways you can reveal your joy is to choose a life wheel area that is demanding a lot of energy. Maybe it doesn't feel as joyful, right? Or maybe it does. Look at what you're doing in that category, okay? Make a list of the actions and tasks that you do in that category. You can choose any one of these, all of these, can do this anytime you want. And then think about, get the list out. Identify those actions and tasks from that area. And then evaluate that area for the level of joy. If you're doing things that bring you zero joy, they contribute nothing to your, to your vision of success, why are you doing that? Okay, it might be because you have to, because I'm gonna tell there is some joy in taking out my trash because at least my kitchen doesn't stink, but it's not something I'm just going to do every day. We do it when it's necessary and for sure when it's weekly, but I can't stop taking out my trash. I stop loading and unloading and loading and unloading and loading and unloading washer. Right? I can't do that. It's not very joyful. So what do you do? You evaluate the level of joy. It is joyful. It's not joyful. Uh, this does not light me up. This does not feel good. I don't appreciate this. However you want to determine what brings you joy. I do have an entire process where I walk people through. Um, it's quite, I don't want to say quite detailed, but it goes much deeper than what we're doing today. So it can help you get a better understanding of your joy. Ultimately, when you determine the joy in an action, in an area, then you get to decide, whew, this is where the fun, do I dump it? Do I delegate it? Or do I redesign it if it brings no joy? So um, I don't, I also do not love doing yard work. There is no joy for me in yard work. I know other people love it. So obviously I can't stop mowing my grass. I can't stop trimming the bushes. I can't stop making sure that my yard is and clean because if I do, I'll get a letter from my HOA society and they will, you know, want to find me or, you know, send me pictures of how terrible my yard looks and all of that. Well, okay, I can't not do it, but I also hate it. I could delegate it. I could hire someone to do it for me so that I have more time to invest in what brings me true joy. I could redesign it and figure out a way to make myself like it more. Maybe I need to create a ritual. I need to get my mind in a place where I'm going to be really excited about doing this. Maybe I'm not going to be excited, but I'm going to do it anyway. And at the end of it, I'm going to have a reward for myself. Maybe it is a glass of wine. Maybe it's coloring a couple pages in my adult coloring book. It might be a video. It might be a call with a friend, whatever it is. 
You take a look at it and you decide what you wanna do with it. Now I mentioned that I went through a process, right? So this is part of the process we took in this particular, it's called the Joy Money Matrix. We looked at every aspect of our lives and businesses and determined uh, like every, you, as you see here, these little sticky notes, everything that we're doing. This is something that you could do your life will. You could just grab some sticky notes, you know, make a few notations and then determine where these things where do they bring you joy? Could just, you know, make three spots on the table, joy, no joy, kind of in the middle, and then figure out what you want to do with those things. So a lot of this, a lot of your journey to being a joyful badass is really about, again, self-awareness. What, what brings me joy? That's knowledge. Anytime you can know more about yourself, then you are better equipped to interact with other people because the creation of self-awareness also makes more aware of other people. I believe more empathy, it can creates more compassion. And I know that because I have embraced joy and badassery, my life has been significantly changed for the better. Um, I, I know that I am more open to people. I know that I am more interested in learning about other people. Now, granted, I'm a girl who values knowledge, but at the same time, it's not exclusive to me. I want to know about myself so that I can better understand other people because we have access to ourselves 24-7, 365 we are never getting away from ourselves as much as we might like to. So I call it becoming best friends with yourself. Meet your inner bestie, right? Know yourself, know who you are, know what you like, know what you value, and then help move you forward so that when you're ready, you can use that joy and that self-knowledge to step out into the world with the bold confidence and take inspired action. So this is really a culmination of everything that I've been sharing with you here in this one slide. I had a dream to become an international speaker. I wrote it down in my dreams journal. I created a vision for what an, inter what, what an international speaking event could be like. For my husband and me, it was us going over there, participating in the event and being a tourist for a week and a half. That, oh my gosh. That hit my knowledge, that hit my relationships, that hit my freedom, that hit one of my joy factors. I wouldn't have been able to do this if I didn't know the one of my values was freedom and, and knowledge. Like learning all of that helped me get out of my own head, out of my own fears and self-doubt and really just jump out. I knew when I got to this conference, I knew my husband and two other people who were speaking there who are also from Austin. There were over 400 people, 500 people within the hotel and within the event. I didn't know Isol, but as you can see, I am now, I, I'm, I'm still connected with these ladies. We communicate on Facebook. We communicate via WhatsApp. They're all from, uh, everyone you see is, is an international um, advocate for women's equality for women's um, equality. You can see it's from the Women's Economic Forum. But if I had not known myself, not known who I was, what I valued, what I wanted, a vision for my future, what brought me joy, where am I putting in my energy, this would not have been possible. So what I hope you take away from this particular slide is that when you know yourself, then you can utilize that knowledge to, to be bold, to be confident, to take a risk, to go across the world and be a speaker at an event or to organized by someone you've never met um, or communicated with only through, you know, social media and, and so on. Not a person that I, I knew a person who knew her, so that was a, a vet for me, right? I, I, I trusted the person who referred me. But ultimately, I empowered action. I said, I am 
a badass. I am going to do something that's slightly risky, that's maybe a little rebellious. It might be innovative. It's definitely outside of the box thinking for me. And that's ultimately what being a badass is about. It's not being bitchy or mean or hateful to other people. It's truly owning your own power and using it for your own good and the good of others. And in order to know your power, you self-aware, you need to be working in alignment with your values your values and your energy outputs are aligned you know what brings you joy and you know that you can act on that with supreme confidence so final thoughts how will or how would becoming a joyful badass impact your work and your life vision without action is merely a dream vision with action can change the world and my vision is to change the world through helping people understand embrace and unleash their own badass so that they can do all the amazing things that they were made to do in this world and now here we are for questions excellent that was wonderful i feel much more joyful and really empowered to go find more of the things that bring me joy. So thank you for that, Jennifer. You're welcome. So everyone, we launched a survey at the bottom. Go ahead and answer that for me. And now is your time to engage with Jennifer directly. Go ahead and send us your questions either in the chat feature at the bottom of the screen or the Q&A button and Jennifer will answer our questions live. So Jennifer, first question. You were discussing the growth mindset earlier, and you discussed how uh, you were able to grow from constructive criticism. Yes. Now, oftentimes, many people maybe aren't taught how to embrace constructive criticism, and it's just viewed as criticism. How do we break down the defensive barriers when we're getting cr constructive criticism? to allow that growth mindset to really take place? Well, I think part of it is having done this for so many years with kids and you know parent conferences where you are giving a lot of constructive feedback and so forth. It's really essential that, first of all, the person giving, and this is of course on the person, so if you're ever in a position where you need to give constructive criticism, the tone and the delivery is really important. And I think it also needs to be given in a situation where you know that this is going to happen. When you're blindsided with some constructive crit criticism, regardless of whether it's constructive, and you were not aware that someone was going to give you some feedback, it can be, like, it can be jarring, right? It can be like, wait, what, where did that come from? So I right. think it is helpful when it's a bit more, I don't want to say planned because, you know, as a teacher, I'm giving feedback all day, but I know that constructive, I know that criticism can be hurtful. And mm -hmm. so when I'm receiving it, I try to put myself in that other, again, it's the self-awareness. It's the, okay, this person is telling me something that they probably don't want to tell me and I don't really want to hear it. So I'm just going to deep breath, take it in mm -hmm. and you know, see if I agree. And sometimes you need to not say anything. I think for me, I usually just don't say a lot and let the criticism come and then process it through and then perhaps ask for a follow-up conversation if anything weird or how did that come up or, or I'm not clear what you're talking about. I find that if you feel overly criticized, it is better to just step away, process, and then come back to it. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, that's quick. helpful to I don't know. Yes. Uh, so quick clarification for the audience. You had referenced a book earlier by Dr. John Demartini, and the name of that book was? The Values Factor. Excellent. Thank you very much. Values Factor. Okay. So when we get stuck in looking for and trying to find our joy, or we don't know where to find the right process, find the right um, context, for our joy. How do we generate new options with our values list um, versus like the, the repetitive thinking? We all tend to, add, to have that negative self-talk or the, the habitual mindsets that we have. How do we find new options to lead us to greater joy later? 
So how do we find new options to find joy? I would, again, all of that to your own self-awareness, right? So if you figured out your values, say you've explored your values, you know that freedom is a value, then you use that information in all of your future decision-making. So you say, my value is freedom. Um, if this particular thing I'm going to do now, or I need to do now, there is no freedom, then the joy oh, it's not aligned with who I am. It doesn't feel like freedom. So the joy is going to be reduced. You have to decide, is this worth it? And do I just suck it up buttercup like we tell everybody all the time? Or do I really look for what could be joyful in this, right? So again, you go back to the trash. If I just reframe it and say, my kitchen won't stink if I do this. There's my, you know what I mean? Like it's as small as that. My kitchen will feel fresh. I will feel like I have taken all this nasty out of my house. It might not be joyful, but it's at least a more positive spin because really our joy is our genius. It is when we are operating in a place where we are just like cranking stuff out and we are on our mark. And that's not possible in every element and aspect of your life. Right, it's what lights no. you up, what puts you, what makes you get up out of bed every morning and be like, yes, I'm doing that. Yes, I, I often find much greater joy when I am just crushing it in all things and everything just seems to be in flow and in alignment with me and my energy is just processing. So I see how the reframing would definitely help us garner more joy in our personal lives and in our professional lives. And so and on that note, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. So on that note on professional lives, what if our careers or our, maybe our jobs right now aren't in alignment with our need for joy? What, or well, just aren't in alignment with joy for us? What, it, what do we do when we're in a job or possibly a career that isn't quite aligned with our values and might be weighing us down? Okay, well, that's where your badassery comes in because if you are truly embracing your own badassness, your own inner power, your own ability to manage your own freaking, that's where it comes into play. Because I was miserable in a job. I was out of alignment with my values because I didn't even know what my values were. I didn't know I valued freedom, but now that I do, that's exactly why I was a round peg in a square hole or a square peg in a round hole, whatever that, that is. This is why it felt hard. This is why it felt taxing and exhausting. And every single day that I left that place, I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to get home. If you were in a situation where you are living for the weekend, you are living for a holiday, you are living to get the hell out of there, you need to get the hell out of there. You need to start really thinking, what the misalignment? Can it be fixed? And if it can't be fixed, if you can't go to your supervisor or your leadership and say, hey, I'm feeling out of alignment and this is kind of why I'm feeling some friction in this role. I've now discovered my value is this or, or it's what really is more joyful for me. Have a conversation to see if there can be adjustments made where you are. And if not, then I would encourage people to embrace that bad assness and, and explore other options that would be more aligned. You know, for example, I know I'm not, I can't work in a queue. It's too noisy. I would be so unproductive. It would be awful. That's a deal breaker for me. I will be miserable in a queue. I can't take a job with that. Right. But I didn't know that in the past. I didn't really understand that's something that I'm considering if, you know, in creating my work. Um, I just, I feel like we've all been societally trained to just accept whatever we've been given. Yes. And just take it, right? You're just lucky, oh my God, you're just lucky to have a job. Wait, I'm lucky to be miserable and desperate and unhappy and all of that impacts my family, my relationships, me, my stress, I'm ill, not in good shape, I'm not healthy. All of that are ripples of being very, in a toxic work environment or in a misaligned, you know, environment. Okay, so uh, just to dig in a little deeper real quick, when we're assessing our, uh, the wheel, what was the wheel you called it? 
Um, it's just like your, like, it's like a gray wheel, just, you know, different, you know, just taking your life and chunking it into different sections. So life wheel, okay. you can Google that and find all kinds life of wheel. different graphics. Yeah. So when we're assessing our life wheel and we pick out different things um, to go on our life wheel, the things that we find joy in will evolve over time, right? Yes, I think so. Okay. But tell me a little bit more about that evolution, because I'm sure, you know, when we're, you're listing out the things on your life wheel, you might be like, oh gosh, what do I do? do in these sections that bring me joy and once you start writing it down obviously it might start to come right. to life a little more in your brain mm -hmm. but it won't stay static forever right it'll no. it'll keep changing it keeps changing because we continue if a, we are in a growth mindset right if we stay in a fixed mindset where we're we're never looking for new information we're never looking for opportunities to grow we feel like we've just pretty much you know tapped out at this particular stage in the game then i really don't have a lot a lot that i can offer you because a lot a lot of what we were talking about comes from that openness to grow and and continue learning right it's a continuing concept and so um ask me again because i got sidetracked by seeing the pole over to the side. Um, oh, sorry about that. Growth mindset. Um, yeah. Joy, yes. Joy evolves, right? Because we're in a, hopefully we're in a growth mindset. So we're meeting new people. We're having new experiences. We're realizing some of our dreams, right? And now that I've got international speaker, girl, I have got a fire lit under me to spend more time overseas, to go, you know, go to other countries, to really deepen those connections with people who are so different from me but yet not so and so i think joy is constantly not constantly evolving but it definitely changes and when you think about your joy your zone of genius um part of the process that i went through is is you can take a look at and i think sometimes it's easier to say what doesn't bring me joy like why is this not joyful you know maybe you can flip it and say don't i feel joyful here and you might find what's missing but ultimately that process helps you look at the things that you do in relationship to the joy of it and the ability to create whatever that success may be for you. So it, it, the, the, it was designed based on money because it was designed for originally for entrepreneurs. So what am I doing that accesses my zone of genius, my joy, and can also make me money. And in our personal work, it's the same thing. If I am so, if I love making spreadsheets, right? That is my, I, and I actually do like making spreadsheets. And there's people who love it, right? I've had clients who hire me simply because they hate spreadsheets and I adore them. Okay. Yeah. If I was making spreadsheets and doing that stuff all day, wouldn't bother me for a second. One of my clients, she would pull her hair out, she would run away, she would scream, there is no joy, she would just like want to fall over and die. Yep. Okay. So if I told you, you're part of your job is now making spreadsheets, you have to do this spreadsheet and turn it into me every Friday. You are now going to be frustrated and annoyed. So can you come to me and say, let's switch this. This is not going to bring me joy. I'm not going to be good at this because I don't like it. Right. So okay. Jennifer loves it. Can we give it to her? So I feel like I've gone off tangent just a bit, but ultimately our joy evolves based, I think on new experiences, relationships, ideas, through that growth mindset. And ultimately, the, the, win, the beauty is where your joy meets your money. So for me, my joy is creating curriculum and teaching workshops because ultimately I'm a teacher. But what I now know is in that environment, in that public education classroom, me with four kids, that is not my joy with teaching, right? I still am a teacher, but that aspect is not joyful. So now I teach adults, I do it online, I do it when I want to, I have a lot of freedom around it. I choose what I'm teaching. No one is telling me what I have to do. Therefore, there's freedom. Okay, final question. Yeah. How often should we reevaluate how we're finding joy, where we're finding joy? I would recommend about every six months. And if you're using your joy, create goals, then I would evaluate those probably every three months. The goals? I would about, I would just straight up reconsider like a couple times a year. Like, okay. Go back and have a reflection about, I mean, you know, am I still in this joyful place? Is this, is this still working for me? Is this still like my zone of genius? And 
go from there. Now, if you're saying, okay, these are all the things I want to create goals. I got a dream. I'm going to use my values to get me to that dream. And you're creating goals. I like to review my goals every quarter and then set them for the next quarter. So if you're, it's just, that's just for goals. You know, like if you're using that information to create goals or a strategy for yourself, um, you definitely need to go back and look at it. But in terms of like general joyfulness, zone of genius, six months, a year, maybe. If you've had okay. significant life changes, you might do it. Like we might all want to evaluate our joy just after these few weeks of being in our, in shelters in place now, because my right. husband and I were talking about how we, we sort of had some rediscoveries. We, we like not being gone 9,000 hours a week. Like, we're wow we're not keeping the roads hot this is kind of nice maybe so whereas i would have told you being gone a lot going to music events and blah 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 was like really joyful mm -hmm. you know it's kind of joyful being at home I, okay you know so life changes can also yeah. create a need to evaluate your joy but just in general i'd say every six months or so okay well thank you for that um, for everyone who wants to connect with Jennifer after this webinar, her information is going to pop up on the screen here. Uh, I do recommend connecting with her on LinkedIn. Check out the stuff that she's doing on her website. She hosts workshops and webinars all the time. Do connect with her. She's going to be a great resource for you. And she has an excellent newsletter that sends out additional resources um, weekly. So yes. Jennifer, such a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Us. You have brought all of us joy today, and we are very, very grateful for you.